Hey, y'all. Welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window. Yes, we are still doing a podcast episode today. And Landon, what is it that we're going to be talking about today with everybody? Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, the movie. It yes. just came out and we're being relevant. <laughs> we actually went to the theaters to see this, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, th- uh, yes, this is my second movie theater visit since uh, the pandemic, Barbie mm-hmm. being number one and mm-hmm. this being number two. So mm-hmm. we figured we'd we'd uh, tie it all in. Yes. Talk about what we liked, what we didn't like, what was different. Uh, we watched it so that you didn't, and ultimately, so that you will go watch it because I think we both enjoyed it. Yeah, um, I actually really liked it, but let's let's get into it, okay, you guys? Yeah. So, um, we of course, uh, it's only in theaters right now. So, so small PowerPoint because like, um, there's only so many screenshots we can pull from the trailers and things like that. But it's still gonna be basically, uh, as far as the talking points go, a typical episode. Okay, so don't be fooled by the screen looking a little bit like it's one of the fandom episodes. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we figured it just it's a very similar deck to what we did for the for the movie and it's just it's just what we need. It's a little bit of a fandom episode kind of. Yeah. But also mostly this movie was good. So let's start our episodes how we always start, and that is favorite things. Karen, what was your favorite thing? Okay, so my favorite thing was the same thing as your favorite thing, which is Dr. Oh, Gall. Got to a fight about it. It just was so good. We could choose. Viola Davis fucking killed this role. She did. She really, really she, did. She went in there and she was like, you know, I'm going to eat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and everybody is just going to have to meet me on my level. And truly was fantastic. So I went in with kind of low expectations of her performance. I'm not going to lie, because when I saw that she was playing this character in the trailer, I was like, oh, this is the same thing she's done a couple of times. Like, you know, Suicide Squad is a great example of this character. I thought like, oh, she's going to come in and play like her hard ass evilish woman. Right. And Dr. Gall is hard ass and evil, but she is also insane. And I just didn't know if I was going to get it, but we got it. She was crazy. There is a very real choice to make it a classic Annalise Keating, or in Annalise Keating, which is one of the characters she plays, Viola Davis yes. character. Yes. Where, like, it's like, oh, that is a natural and realistic interpretation of Dr. Gall, where you play down the crazy a little bit more, or it's a little bit more contained, and like, choice, and a choice that she could probably blow away, but we've seen her do before so going into it expecting that and then getting just wildly fucking insane dr gall so good who is so good like i think i dr gall was my favorite thing from when we broke down the book Mm -hmm. i think i prefer this version of dr gall because it seems like just a little bit like a little bit more insane a little bit more insane built in realism yeah, and I thought it was more like realistically insane. Yes. In, there's there's parts of the book where Dr. Gall's insanity comes off a little bit goofy, you know? Yes. And that does not happen in the movie. And yet she's still doing the weird rhyming, the weird mannerisms. Like she's still doing all of that. But it comes off as so much more real than it does in the book. Um, so I agree. I actually prefer this Dr. Gall over the Dr. Gall of the books. I think Viola Davis makes some really interesting choices that makes mm-hmm. Oxter like like that fits in that that of like, oh, you can understand how this is a real person. You can yes. see like, oh, there's that amazing moment where Lucy Gray has won the Hunger Games, the snakes, she's singing her ballad, the snakes are still coming after her. Mm-hmm. And Cornelius or Cornelius is just like stop it like she won she won and you can see the hate and the anger and the need for revenge and the want to just destroy the whole thing uh like just there and you can see her inspiration and it's so good and you believe it oh yeah i i was like oh because i i think what this choice really did also really showed how much snow was needed as not just her apprentice and set and uh person to like succeed her but also to balance her 
Mm-hmm. because like he's the he in the books he does the same thing where he's the one making the point of like you need hope you need to keep you need to keep a winner for some reason you can't just mm-hmm. kill all of them but you truly see her want to do that you truly see that this is just her want to mass murder all of them one by one mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yes and it makes 100%. me want percent i want her story i know we'll never get it uh, and, and I know that there's probably not a story that necessarily needs to come of that, but I'm like, man, I want to know what happened to her during the war to get her to this place. Yeah. I mean, some people I think are just more predisposed to having their bigotries come out and, and whenever they get the the power and the ability to act on their bigotries to just mm-hmm. do it. And I, and I, she, and she's like the craziest one, right? Like, and I don't think most people are like this, but I do think you do. There are some people in this world that given the chance would do these sorts of things, you know, given the power to be able to, they would. Um, they're just like, you know, some people are more susceptible to their bigotries than others, you know, because yes. we all have them. No, I absolutely agree. Uh, but she she blew it out of the freaking water. And she as did. soon as as soon as it was like, oh, this is gonna be good. Yeah. As soon as I saw it. So if her you couldn't screen. tell by from our favorite things episode, this is not a spoiler free podcast. Oh okay? yes, we forgot so, to say that. <laughs> yeah, we did forget to say that. So if you're planning on going to this movie and you have not read the books yet and so you don't know what happens, this is not the review for you. Go watch someone else's. <laughs> yes. But if go you watch have someone... read the book and you're going into the movie after reading the book, this is the review for you. Hang out with us. Yes. And then also like go watch uh, our stream where we summarize what happens in the book yes. because we're not going to summarize what happened in the movie because no. it's the same exact thing in the book. Pretty much. We're just going to focus on the differences, um, which differences that were neutral, which differences we liked, which differences we didn't like, um, but we're not going to re- redo a summary because there's there's no point. It would be the same. Yeah, no, it's the exact same story. So yes. let's get started into that, I guess. I guess we could do a overview very quickly of the story of Songbirds and, the, and Snakes is, or the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes is about Coralina Snow and his time uh, in his, in the first or the 10th annual Hunger Games as he tries to support Lucy Gray through it. Uh, inevitably, there's some attraction and shit happens. <laughs> That's what you get for a summary. Yes, yes. Fascism okay. happens. <laughs> Things happen. So major dif- the major differences between this version and the book version is really two main things. First off, Act 3 is gutted. So yeah. whenever Corio goes off to... Um, the uh to district 12 to serve as a peacekeeper after you know all the craziness from the games and he's basically like dishonorably you know he's like he's punished he's he's he doesn't get to graduate he has to go be a peacekeeper um a lot of that is gutted so what i mean when i say that is that the entire sequence where you meet like his fellow soldiers that doesn't happen you don't even know anything about them you only know that sejanus is also there and because they cut that that means that they cut the entire sequence where Corio doesn't really know if um, Lucy Gray is coming back to 12, if they if she even survived after the Hunger Games, if the Capitol killed her afterwards, um, or if they did let her go, if she was going to go somewhere else, if she was going to run away, live in the Capitol. He doesn't know for the longest time. And so what ends up happening in the movie is because that entire sequence is cut, he kind of just goes to her first performance from go, it feels like it's like he gets there and the next day they're having a performance and he goes and there she is. So that whole like buildup of anticipation where his feelings towards her um, move over into the overtly controlling sense um, doesn't happen. Uh, so that's the the big major thing that has changed. Now, of course, we don't have his, we don't have a voiceover in this movie. It's not that style movie. So like, I can't say I disagree completely with this change. You know, it probably would have been boring and should have been cut. You know, we, we are talking about these two, these specific changes because they are probably necessary for the medium in which it is given. Uh, But it is, it is, it does, it does sting a little that we don't get to know more about like what Corian Linus is thinking as a peacekeeper or, uh, and that's also something like we said in the, in our stream last time when we were reviewing the book that we also didn't think the time between the end of the Hunger Games and him meeting up with Lucy Gray was long enough at all. And mm-hmm. so the fact that it shortened it even more, uh, I, I think it is a disservice to understanding how the character is switching. And yeah. they don't 
and we're going to get into that a little bit later, but they don't necessarily do anything to correct it or to show anything. You just think he's still in love at this point. Yeah. So um, we're going to put a little pin in that. Remember that <laughs> um, for for the end segment where we go into a lot more detail on that point. But this is the decision that causes a lot of the points that we're going to make for that section. Um, and what they what did was to the, make up for that. Sorry, oh. go ahead. I was going to say what they did to make up for that time that they cut yes. out of the third was that they put it all in the first part. Mm-hmm. Uh, n- I would say probably 50% of this movie is the Hunger Games, leading up to yeah. the Hunger Games and the Hunger Games, which is not a bad thing. There is a reason this is a Hunger Games novel or a book. This is a reason that there's a Hunger Games movie. This is an action movie. Yeah. And so needing to have that action movie it, it is good. And I thought it was interesting. And I think really showed like a lot of differences between the different kinds of games that we had seen previously. However, it took away from the character study that the novel was intended to be. Yeah. So, you know, we talked about how like the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, why I think there was a lot of divide in the fandom between like love and hate is because it was not an action book. It was a character study, whereas the original trilogy is firmly like action in genre and dystopia as well. But it's it's action and the movies are action. But this, the book, the Hunger Games themselves, like the like act two is supposed to be the Hunger Games act. But the Hunger Games themselves, you really don't see much of them, okay? because the technology is crappy. So even though Lucy is in the games, Corio can't see a lot of what's going on. The the cameras that they do have don't really have sound on them. There's all kinds of like weird things with like dropping off the um, dropping off the the water and stuff for them where like the drones don't work right. Like everything is crap. So you don't really know what happens until afterwards Corio finds out, you know, um, like he gets told. And so in this, because it's a movie, obviously that's boring. And people are going to the Hunger Games movie expecting to see some kids fighting. That's what they want. They want teenagers killing each other, okay? Killing each other. And so what that turns into in the movie is that we get an actual, like, fairly lengthy um, games sequence that in reality takes place over less days. So the way that it's framed is it's like as if the games are done within two days. In the book, the games take like over a week to fully be done, but there's more time spent in the games themselves. So even though the the time is reduced, the screen time is lengthened, if that makes sense. And even, yes, and even on that same like level, um, like, in the movie, it even hints at the idea that the Hunger Games usually only lasts a day in general. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, okay, this is, this is it, it was an interesting change that they made um, because yeah. they, they made it seem like a lot of people were bored with the idea that they had to keep watching this happen. Yeah. And they thought it was gross. Yeah. They were over it. They were over it. Um, Yeah. I, and I also think it was an interesting choice that the most dramatic and most action-packed moments that happen in the book are some of the least action-packed parts of what happens in this um, in this section of the movie, yeah. in this act, if you would. Like uh, the explosion or uh, them sneaking in to get, or him sneaking in to get Sir Janus and the follow-up of that. All of that in the most part felt pr- like less high stakes than other parts of the this act. Um, which is a very interesting thing because they were the most exciting and most action packed of the book. Yeah, they were. So basically what that means for the movie is that you know how Lucy Gray spends a lot of time down in the um in the tunnels from the attack and in the um air ducts and things like that like hiding. Well, there's cameras in there now. And so they can see everything that's mm-hmm. going on. So like we see the progression of like Thresh's rabies for example. We we see and they and they made a couple of other small changes like um like Dill is is uh is a victim of the the water instead of it being the the little one i can't remember the little one's name um that made lucy feel so bad in the book she was the victim of the poison water so they changed that um and all those changes were fine like i really didn't think that there was anything necessarily particularly good or bad about it it was just kind of like changing for the medium and it turned the movie into not as much of a character study as the book so if like 
us, your favorite part was the fact that it was a character study in the book. Go into the movie with tempered expectations, because yeah. if you're going in there thinking it's going to be a character study like the book, I think that's where a few of the people that were disappointed, where a lot of that came from, because there are some book lovers that were disappointed. And I believe that that's why. I also think that it's important to mention, too, uh, that because of like another another piece that you lose in the character study is because you're par- far, you're seeing all these murders happen you're seeing all the action you're seeing yourself in the games when when Cornelius ends up killing um i can't remember his name but the, the small the the kid yeah. uh, at, that attacks him it's less impactful there isn't a moment that it is a moment for Corn. It is a moment for him that he. This is the first time that he has let his base anger and that human part of himself like mm-hmm. take over uh, for the survival. That that really connects Doctor Gall with him. Um, this is the first time that that happens, and it's kind of breezed over in some way because you've seen so much death before that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And it's just the perspective change of it being if you being in Corio's head versus a camera lens. And yeah. and because of some of the way that they made these changes with turning the games into a larger like larger action set piece in the movie. One thing that does happen to the movie and this is the same criticism a lot of people had of the book is that it's a bit long. And I did think mm-hmm. this when I was watching it too that maybe it could have had 30 minutes cut from it. But what they would have cut I have no clue because they already they already cut get gutted act three. And and I would have cut some of those action set pieces personally that I know they weren't going to cut. So yeah. that was also something in regards to the movie. So if you felt like the book was too long and meandering, you're going to probably come away from the movie feeling the same way, despite the fact that it's more of an action movie. I think that they did a really, really good job writing for the audience they knew that they were going to have. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and the reality is, is that with compromise, no one ends up 100% happy. <clears throat> and that's kind of the definition of this movie. Yep. Is like, oh, we compromised because everything, for the most part, everything important and necessary to the plot is there. Yeah. Like, even people who have never read the book can put together what is happening it's a little harder but they can put it together yeah uh so nothing is missing from the plot but they also needed to make it more exciting so you can't cut anything yeah and it just is made a kind of like really good in terms of i i want to make it clear in terms of book adaptations this movie is very good yeah uh but it's not it's not like the first hunger games Movie. no <laughs> or the, even or even catching fire like where it was like holy shit you got it yeah i would say uh, more like it's no catching fire because i have issues yeah, with the first no catching fire. movie as y'all know <laughs> So yeah, so we're going to put a pin in that point as well, because again, it's going to come back in our final segment, where we talk a little bit more about like the different camera as the lens versus being in Coriolanus's head and hearing his thoughts. Before we get into that, it's time to complain. It's time to whine. It's time to tell you guys some things that we didn't like. (laughs) Would it be an episode of Interstage Window if we didn't talk about the things that we didn't like? (laughs) Uh, Because it's just classic. From our Harry Potter to here, and you'll hear it from me a lot about Twilight. Uh, <laughs> I started on here. it. I started on the first book, and I've already oh. got gripes. Anyways. <laughs> it's a lot. All right. Um, right. Let's talk about the number one thing that I think mm-hmm. bothered both of us. Yes. And that was that this A, actress is phenomenal, and B, character is so good in the book, and they cut her off at the knees in this movie. And what was so funny is we yeah. found different things to be annoyed by in regards to in regards to Tigress. But still, we yes. both thought like she was done dirty by the movie. She really, really was. I I felt that every scene that she had, I believed her. I liked her. This was, in my opinion, I just want to make it clear because there's a lot of hate for this actress. In my opinion, this was not an actress choice. I think that everything I saw with the actress, she was great. Mm-hmm. It was a writing choice. They yeah. just didn't give her time. So here's where I have like a a thing to kind of support what you're saying. So at the end, when Coriolanus asks Tigris how he looks, she says, you look just like your father. So they so they have the so she delivers that perfectly. OK, yes. but here's like a specific gripe I have that has nothing to do with the actress herself. OK, in the book. 
The snows are so incredibly poor. They're literally hungry. Tigris is a working girl, okay? She has a job. Yes, it is in fashion, and yes, that is her thing, but... And I never imagined her actually being able to live out any fashion choices. Whereas in the movie, she's got a different dress every time you see her, and they do not look out of date. So what I would have liked to see that's a slight that's slightly different that would have solved this for me and not given me the impression that they didn't understand Tigress is she works. Put her in a work uniform for like half her scenes and only let her have a dress when she's actually accompanying Corio to the games or whatever, right? But like when she's in her house, she's wearing like a, a dress, like a fancy dress. And I just don't think that she was wearing that in the books. Now, they don't talk about it because Corio doesn't give a fuck about what she's wearing. So that's, that's not explicit, right? So what they did isn't like against the text, but it's against the idea of what Tigris is going through. So I I have I am in the understanding of why they didn't put her in a work uniform because that would seem that she had to work and that is cheap and they cannot give that presentation. However, why not reuse things in her her wardrobe? Why is she, you know, wearing a, a undershirt that isn't the same undershirt she wears in another seat in another uh, in another outfit? Like there is a way that same thing that they did in that opening scene where they're reusing uh, Coralinus's father's shirt and redesigning it to make it look new, to make it look like like why isn't she doing that with herself? And her, why didn't the costumers choose to do that with her outfits to un, yeah. to give this idea that they're fucking poor? Mm -hmm. They're like poor, poverty poor. Yeah, and one of her dresses has like intricate lace on it, and you cannot tell me in a post war time that lace is cheap. That is very yeah. expensive, not only to have but to maintain. And still, years later, there's it's not doesn't look threaded or anything. Like miss me, that doesn't make any sense. I also think that they missed an opportunity of really showing Tigress's relationship with Corio. Mm -hmm. um, she is supposed to be his conscience. She is supposed to be the good. The thing that is rooting him and is really driving him forward. Not only It's not only his ambition. It's not only his legacy. But it is also her and taking care of her. He doesn't give a shit for the most part about his grandmother. He wants to make sure she can get fed. Because she's doing all this work. Not only is she working. But it is heavily implied that she is in the sex trade. In order yeah, to or at least afford... Was. Whether or she was. is now or not is ambiguous, but she definitely was. In order to afford to put like food on their plate and that yeah. this is his time like of being like, you have provided for me for so long. I can now provide, I cannot wait to provide for you. And that closeness is just lost. And the, I, I truly believe it's because they, they kind of didn't give her a spine and they also cut her at the knees as far as how often she is in the book. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So yeah, Tigress in the movie, um, not even close to the Tigress you get in the books as far as her impact and um, the appeal of her character, unfortunately. And I don't think it has anything to do with the actress because no. the one major line she had, she does an amazing job with. Her character, it just wasn't the character we had seen. Yeah. And yeah, it just, it didn't work, unfortunately. Yeah didn't work um so next uh we uh, i didn't have a screenshot for this but we also want to just talk about in general uh the kind of tying to tigris uh the costuming mm -hmm. in general um yes i think that they do a really good job with Coriolanus's costuming but tigris's costuming and everybody else in that family's costuming doesn't really reflect how desperate they are their yeah. life in some ways doesn't exactly reflect how desperate they are <laughs> um and i think that there is other ways that they could have really hit that home because that is such a driving point in the book mm -hmm. is how fucking poor this uh oh landon froze okay so what she was trying to say is like in the capital you cannot tell that the capital is much poorer than it used than it than it becomes in the um later trilogy 
right? So basically, when you're watching the movie, the capital fashions are all the same as the capital fashions were in the original Hunger Games trilogy. And yet, it's supposed to be like generations in the past. So it's generations in the past, and yet, here I switch back. There. So it's generations in the past, and yet everything for the capital people looks basically the same as the trilogy that's supposed to be, that's coming later, right? The districts also basically looks the same. Oh, shoot, it's me reconnecting, I just realized. Okay. I lost internet. All right, we're going to pause the recording. We're back, we're back, we're back. I'm so sorry. Okay. My internet died. My internet died. So anyways, we were talking about the costuming. Um, yes. And then I think you were about to go into like the costuming of the districts as well. Yes. Well, and then because we don't have this, like, I, I did enjoy some of the costuming in the Capitol. I just wanted to touch on that because I, I think that the it shows a lot more uniform rather than a lot more wild, although having hints of what it will be in the future. Um, and a lot more lux like a lot more luxurious than we'll obviously see in the districts, but not seriously luxurious as it will be in the Katniss Everdeen era. Uh, but in the districts, specifically in District 12, there's no difference in costuming at all between the two movies, even though mm -hmm. they take place 80 or not 80, uh, 60 years apart ish, 55. Um and and while I understand like it wants to show that they're poor and they've always been poor, I think it would have been just a slightly better choice to have the costumes look just a little bit nicer and really, really show that like, no, what Katniss inherited was her grandmother's mm -hmm. like like that it is old and decrepit and so you have to have it so much nicer in order to get that understanding mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and I just don't think it shows it yeah i just think i just think overall most of the costuming just felt like oh they did the same thing that they did in the original hunger games yes. you know i just think there could have been more thought all around to it like if i really um thought about it i probably have criticisms even of lucy's rainbow dress although it didn't bother me when i was watching it but like if i really think about like well what would i have done you know i don't know and like the fact that all the tributes basically had the same clothes on and it's like they weren't necessarily all these like working kids and yet that's what they all looked like, you know. I, and even if that wasn't a, an intended choice, like there, it was different enough that it didn't like look, look like a uniform. They should have just put them in a uniform. Yeah. If they like, and then I know that. that means that Lucy couldn't wear her dress, but maybe that's something she sneaked in or snuck in or something like that. Something. Like I think, or I think that put... there could have been... Or just put other kids in their version of Sunday Best, you know? I don't know. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that there just, it, there wasn't that big of a of, of a difference between 60 years of, of poverty. Yeah. Like, if, obviously, the, the districts were not great before the Capitol, mm -hmm. but there is, sign or before the war, but there is significant hints that their life becomes worse after the war. Yeah. So... We need to see what that worse would look like after 60 years. And if that's the standard, then we need to put them in a better point, point than then, when, then right? where they were. Yeah, exactly. And it just wasn't done. So overall, I just think the costuming, they I think they hire end up hiring the same person that did the Hunger Games. And I think that person is just like too into that that what they did for their original movies and they should have just gone a different direction hi lunar by the way sorry we had a disconnect so i wasn't we weren't really live when you were talking about getting your nails done but i hope they look beautiful so yeah the mm. the the costuming in general and tigress is the main um victim of this unfortunate problem yes um and then clemencia, clemencia. Clemencia is uh, a colleague slash I want to call her a colleague because it feels like a business, uh, a schoolmate of yeah. of Koros, who uh, takes credit for writing uh, their pro a proposition to um, Dr. Gall, mm -hmm. even though she and Corio were supposed to work on it together. And in the movie, Corio wrote it completely by himself. Yeah. Um, she takes sole cre credit and ownership for it. And the choice was so bad because 
she takes full credit and Dr. Gall is like, oh, well, I've accidentally dropped the the paper into this vat of, uh, of snakes that will bite you if you are lying. So go ahead and pick them up. And she still does it. Yeah. And it was just such an interesting choice of making her look like such an idiot. It's just, Even she though she so knew- dumb. She knew what was going to happen. Like she's sitting there like shaking and obviously doesn't want to do it and, and continues to do it. And it just was like a really weird choice. And I know it sounds so small, but like it, it, there's a lot of small choices like that. And this mm-hmm. particular one was just like, so like, bitch, no. Yeah. Cause to remind, you of, how it, to remind yeah. you of how it goes down in the books, basically the papers are in there Corio reaches in and gets some of them, right? And the snakes don't bite him, right? Because he wrote the paper and they're used to him. And they don't and they don't know at this point that the snakes are dangerous, right? Yes. At all. They're just they think they're just like regular they don't know. They have no idea. And so then Clemencia thinks it's safe because Corio did it and it was fine. And so then she reaches in and gets bit, and then it's like the shock surprise. She doesn't end up coming off looking dumb. She ends up coming off like looking like a teenager that's just taking a risk because like, oh, well, it worked for him. It will probably work for me. Let me try it. It's much more and it, understandable. And with that, Dr. Gull still gets the same information, which is who really wrote this paper? Yeah. Who really put their blood, sweat, and tears into this? It was obviously Corio because he was the one physically writing all of it. Uh, and and so it, it makes it like look less like an idiot mm-hmm. and also gives Dr. Gall like actually some like conniving power like give you we understand how backwards and manipulative she can be even not just to the people that she views can be victimized and deserve to be victimized but also everyone around her that she plays Mm -hmm. games with everybody that's kind of what you get from the book and from this she's just like oh you think you wrote it go ahead put your life on the line yeah and it's it's just a it's a very different thing that doesn't add up with the writing yeah, there's just no reason to change the scene in that way. It would have taken the same amount of time to do it the way it was before. So it just doesn't make sense. And yet they changed it. And it hurts her character. Uh, and I think it was to set up, like, truly how dangerous and how feared these stakes are to everybody. Um, but it's like, oh, you could have done that same thing in a different yeah. way. Yeah, I think it would have had the same results. So these were some of these were some of the changes that we really were not super happy with when we were watching the movie. But... There's a lot of um, similar, similarly like small changes that we actually did really like. So let's talk about a couple of those. When this happened on screen, I gasped. It's the opening scene. So I went into this wondering, how the fuck are they going to communicate to an audience that hasn't read the book? The direness of trauma and the situation that the capital comes from during this time in Coriolanus, when all we have experienced is the opulency of like the Roman capital. Mm-hmm. How are they going to do that? Yeah. And sending baby Coriolanus and baby Tigris through the streets to look for food while there is a man straight up hacking off the leg of another dead body in terms and like justifying cannibalism because the people are so dire and so hungry and like that brutal act that is so beyond anything else we have seen from these books and from the series was the perfect way to do it so shortly and succinctly clap on whatever writer came up with that idea fantastic yeah and that's what the movie opens with so yes. a lot so a lot of the inner monologue about the horrors of the war, this scene takes care of it. You don't have to yeah. worry about the fact that it's missing. It's there in that scene. And Corio is even shocked by it. Like the way it goes down, Corio's like, what is he doing? And Tigris goes, He's hungry. And it's like, oh. You you like and it's because it's presented from a child, there's like an innocence to it, but you also realize like how deeply scary this the world that they grew up in were was and how like it sets up 
Coralinus is thinking of doing anything to survive so well because that is what he grew up in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we love the opening scene. We thought it was amazing. Really awesome choice. Such um, a good choice. And did a really good job of taking care of a lot of the stuff that was in Corio's head in the book. So loved it. Love there was it. a couple of other changes, though. There was one change I liked in particular. Okay, so in the books, y'all remember that we kind of were like, Lucky is just the same character. You know, it's just a Flickerman and a Flickerman. It's the same character as in the as in the previous books. But okay. And I found him like annoying and cheesy and cringy in the books. But in the movies, I found him annoying and cheesy and cringy in a good way. He actually made me laugh a couple of times. And I thought like the extra ham made his character better. So, you know, where like Tigress, they kind of messed up a little bit where like Dr. Gall was improved by toning her down ever so slightly. Lucky was improved by ratcheting him up a little bit. And I just thought it was actually entertaining. Here's the deal. It was entertaining. The actor did it correctly. I am not angry with what happened with the choice. I simply, it was not my top thing. It was fine. Uh, but I appreciate that that you loved it. And I think that that is important because it is, he is really cringe and bad in the books and i honestly think there was only two ways to go about it and that mm -hmm. was to make him like monotone newscaster boring very serious all the time uh or to ham him up in this do this way. do what and, they did and yeah. either i think would have worked and would have net positive and would have been better than what they put in the books uh but this was the choice and it was a good choice Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, I totally agree. So when it comes to to Lucky, basically, I think he was improved by the movie. And I'll give you just a little snippet of an example of what I mean. So like, while when they realize that the Hunger Games are going past one day, that it's actually going to take another day or two, there's like this little kind of side interaction where he's on the phone trying to get his dinner reservation changed because he's going to like, sorry, honey, I'm going to be late coming home from work today. And he's like, I'll get the dinner reservation changed. Don't worry. And he's like, you know, can we do like a 9 p.m. dinner instead? You know? <laughs> the and the children are not killing each other fast enough. Like, that yes. is very much the tone of it. It was very funny. Yes. Oh, my God. It was um, so funny. It was. So, yes, yeah. No. So, changes we liked. And then there's one more. There's one more. Y'all, guess what? The characters actually sound like they're from Appalachia in the movies. The heck? Well, yes. They didn't do that in the original. And the accents are not mentioned at all in any of the books. But these, this movie made the correct choice. And they literally sounded like they were from Coal Country. So a couple of things with that. Um, uh, Lucy, Bar Lucy Gray has the cutest accent in the freaking world. She did such a good job with it. Yeah. Uh, she It absolutely sounds legitimate and real. I like the concept of... Uh, what this correction can, what you can connect with this connection. The mm -hmm. idea, and this is my old hand canon, this is not a Susan Collins because Susan Collins did, it, it did have Katniss having an Appalachian uh, accent. But in my head, I'm like, oh, it would make sense that two generations earlier uh, in the in the aftermath of the war, that a lot of a lot of people had really heavy accents. And that over the years, it was extinguished out because A, it wasn't cool. And B, we're, we're forming into a worker force rather where there isn't any, any, any individualism, uh, which includes accents. And that could explain why Katniss doesn't have one. Again, my head canon, but them, them having the choice of having people actually have accents in this book, in, in this movie, instead of ignoring it like they did mm -hmm. in the other ones, made that head canon plausible and feasible and i appreciated that <laughs> i think it's one of those things where like that's a great fandom headcanon but let's acknowledge the reality that they just didn't find those accents marketable back when the hunger games yeah. movies were being made and now those accents are more marketable that's the difference um yes. you know i think if they were going to remake the hunger games movies they'd give them all appalachia accents you know i actually disagree with that you don't think they would i think I, I don't think they would because I think it still would be a teen wrong. Like it's still like how it was marketed was differently. So maybe if they marketed what the Hunger Games were meant to be differently now than they would have then. But if it had kept the same marketing of 
uh, PETA versus Gale. This is for the teens. This is for this group of people. I think that they would have made it as yeah, but as they wouldn't make it like that possible. if they were making it now. It wouldn't be that type of marketing if they're no. making it now. You're right on that. Yeah. So I don't know. We'll see. So I'm sure. Give it five years, there will be an HBO remake. Remake. <laughs> but as they're doing with everything, my God, not that we need one. The original Hunger Games movies are great. To be clear. <laughs> yes. No, they were fantastic. Please don't create. Please don't write over a masterpiece. I understand the want to rewrite other things, but don't do the Hunger Games because it's fantastic. <laughs> um, yes. Yes. No, fantastic. Uh, and then the thing that blew us all the way away, mm-hmm. that overall amazing, was the acting. Now, before we get into amazing, how, how amazing the actors are, we, we do need to mention one performance. Mm-hmm. One, one, small, one small performance. Karen, why don't you take this one? Yeah, because this is your Peter point. Dinklage, <laughs> Peter Dinklage gave the same type of performance he always gives. I feel like there was more, much more nuance to um, to this character in the books, uh, whereas Peter Dinklage could just kind of played him as like a drunkard, you know, which he is. But I think there's a lot of um, more complex pain and sadness in regards to how he feels about the Hunger Games and his role in creating them in the books that doesn't really exist in the movie. Now, that being said, I love Peter Dinklage. He can do anything Mm -hmm. and I will think that it's good, but I know he can do better and he just did his typical good. And it was kind of hard to like look at that compared to like Viola Davis Davis's excellent and like think that he was on par with the other like actual A-list people that were in this movie. Cause unfortunately he wasn't. If you look at the A-listers, he was he was the least interesting A-lister on here. Yeah. And I think I think it's a curse of um typecasting. Yeah. I think that he Peter Dinklage, again incredibly talented could play anything uh and has in some ways played anything uh but is becoming very typecasted for a certain angry drunken complex character yeah that is played very similarly to how some of his bigger roles were played and yeah, i like want to make it clear basically game of thrones messed him up that he's gonna I, play Tyrion forever I and I, I want to make it clear that I think that he did a really good job of playing this character without me seeing Tyrion. I did mm-hmm. not see Tyrion in this character, but I saw Peter Dinklage playing a Peter Dinklage character. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and that I think is the like it's like okay, this is just who he is playing, and in some ways that's not terrible because we have this this meta idea of casting that I really hope that they did, that the casting director looked at it and did it purposefully. And that was the spread of known actors in this movie yeah. is very, very interesting. The people who are playing the important people in the capital, for example, example, Dr. Gall and uh, the, and the Dean, are A-list celebrities, are recognizable faces that you would know. And therefore, there is some like idea psychologically that you recognize them as people of authority watching them on screen because you recognize their faces and you know that they're A-list actors. Mm -hmm. Whereas all of the students, most of the, or I should say most of the students, most of the people who were on the lower, on the, on the lower levels are fairly unheard of. Yeah. Um, and because of that, they're up and coming, which is very similar to what is actually happening on the screen. And that is a really cool choice to make. Yeah, I liked it. I was I was pretty, really happy to see that and see how it played out in the movie. Because I think it does. Yes. It makes you subtly think the thing that you're supposed to think about, like the old older characters versus the younger characters in the capital. Yes. Yeah. And and like even then, like there there was a choice in which I know he wasn't in much as much in the books, but there was a choice in which they could have given um Plinth, like uh Sir Genesis' father, a larger role and given him a familiar actor. They chose not to. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. um even though he, he's barely in the movie but they chose not to because he's not as well known mm-hmm. he's new to the capital he's not as established uh it, it was just a really like subtle way of showing who is important in this world because you recognize who they are not just because we're telling you to but because you actually do yep for sure and then there's one more acting thing that we want to mention i would be remiss if i did not say um you know that the chemistry between Coriolana Snow and Lucy Gray Baird is off the charts. These two actors, they are so into each other and they so sell it. And this book as a movie would not have worked if these two actors did not have amazing chemistry. They did so well on every level. On mm-hmm. the on, on like every point in their relationship, I believed what their relationship was meant to be in this that moment. Like yeah. I did not get romantic vibes at the very beginning because they there wasn't any at the very beginning. They were trying to survive and help each other. And then when things started taking a turn and they started getting closer, you believed that too. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden when things felt off, you felt it from both of them. Yep. And it was so good at every step of the relationship in this chem- in the chemistry. They matched it. They got it. And it yep. was so freaking awesome. We loved it. Basically. Yes. After seeing it, um, I would not have changed either of these actors for anything. They were perfect. Have you heard about, did I tell you about the story of like how Rachel got the role? No, tell us the story. Okay. So I, I saw this in an interview. So Rachel um, was working on several other things at the time and had been away from California um, where she lives and away from her boyfriend for quite a while. And so she auditioned and she ended up getting the role and she taught in, in the interview, she talks about how like heavily she considered it, but knew that this was going to push her away uh, and out of where she lived for like six months. And she just, she hadn't been home in almost a year and she decided she was like, I can't, I can't do that. I need to go home because she had been away. And so she turned it down. Well, the next day, turns out that separately from all of this, unbeknownst to the casting director, they had found the perfect Sir Janus and offered him the job. Turns out, Rachel's boyfriend. Oh, so in real life, she is dating the actor for Sir Janus. She is dating the actor for Sir Janus. Uh, They offered him the position, and when she found out... uh, because they said, like, you when you're in that high of a level, you sign NDAs and stuff like that. So you yeah, can't yeah. even tell significant others. Uh, she she found out. She called the casting director back and was like, hey, um, turns out you guys just hired my boyfriend, which solves my problem. So if the job's still available, that would be really great. That's awesome. I love that. Uh, So just a really funny like little thing that I was in all of the research for this. I was like, oh, that's so adorable. I love that so much. That's amazing. Yes. So overall, fantastic. Yeah. Great chemistry with these guys. Okay. All right. Next. Uh, I think we have a note from our sponsor. We do. Y'all, today's episode is brought to you by Landon. And this and her book, The Lessons I've Paid For, which you can get on Amazon today. Okay, let me put a yes! link in the chat for y'all. Please. It's amazing. I'm very happy and very proud of it. Uh, and I love it very, very much. And I think and other people who have read it really like it. And I think you'd like it too. So please read it and support and just, an artist. <laughs> let me just open this up. Like it's not it's not as heavily illustrated as the previous no. one. It is mostly poetry, but the illustrations are also really beautiful. Like I just want to show you one that I really liked. This flower right here. Can the camera see it or is it too bright? No, it, it can, can see, see it. it. Okay. Yes. Like like stuff like this. So the artist that Landon has for this in addition to her writing is like really really good. So if you are a fan of poetry, I highly recommend this just as I recommended her prior one which you can also find on her um on her Amazon, but the link that I just posted in the chat is to the new book specifically and it's available yes. on the on a digital, right? So yes. you can do if you just want to read a few pages, you can totally do that and Landon still um is supported from that. 
Yeah. And if you have Kindle Unlimited, it's completely free. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if you if you read a lot and you have you are subscribed to Kindle Unlimited, then you can just read it and still support me. It, it still pays me that way. So I'll take it. Yes. <laughs> so everybody, if well, you've not um, gotten her book yet, go get her book. Please. And then like tell friends because I'm trying to market out here and it'd be hard marketing. Uh, <laughs> it's <is> very hard. <laughs> and if you want to help so, her market, you need to go on her TikTok. So that's where yes. TikTok is linked to. That's where I already knew about some of the poems because she had she had posted them like I have, as TikToks. I have some very pretty aesthetic videos and then poetry over it. It's very yes. pretty. Yes. <laughs> so buy my book. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that brings us into our final topic. So we've kind of like gone through all of the changes. Um, we've talked about the acting, but there's really one major thing that you need to know in regards to this movie. And that is because it is a traditional movie, you don't have any voiceover. And remember from the book, the whole point of the book is it's a character study on an unreliable narrator. So we wanted to take a moment to talk about unreliable narrators and morally gray characters in movies where you have the perspective of the camera instead of being inside the head of the character. So. It's tough. Mm -hmm. Because, and and it was very interesting. I am... I saw this movie with a friend of mine who has never read the Hunger Games movies or books, had seen the movies, and has didn't read Songbird, the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. So they've so only ever seen the movies, period. Only ever seen the movies, period. And didn't have any context coming into this on necessarily what it was about, other than the trailers. And her takeaway was that Lucy Gray Beard Bard was just as evil and selfish as. Uh, Coralina Snow. And and wrong. and wrong. However, an understandable take if you have no context. Yep. Because this story, because an un, um, unreliable narrator in a novel presents with you the facts, and your job as a reader is to read what is their tr- their truth and the truth Mm -hmm. and discern the difference between the two because what is happening because there is if you're in a first person perspective or following one like a a uh, limited third person perspective you're only getting the insights on one character Mm -hmm. and that one character doesn't define the world and so when you're reading the book you're learning that lucy gray baird is just a good person who continues to believe the best in the worst of men Mm -hmm. uh you don't get that in this movie because in a movie what you see we believe is the truth of what is happening Mm -hmm. because that's how movies are presented you're you're not inside the head your eagle eye point of view and that's how this movie is oh. presented too, by the way. There's nothing in the movie that yeah. shows when perspectives are skewed by Coriolanus's thoughts. That doesn't happen. It's just not shot that way. Yeah. So everything that Coriolanus does seems reasonable. Yeah. And doesn't seem like a spiral going down that is so that that is that that tips into evil mm-hmm. because him betraying Serjanus makes sense. Him not trusting Lucy Bard makes sense. And it really only makes sense because of the paranoia that's seeping into his brain. Yeah. That we uh, in a movie don't get to see. Yeah. So I'll give you some examples. So like when Sejanus is someone Sejanus is is hanged when he dies uh, in the book, Corio is going through his stuff and he has kind of a meltdown. But in the book, the reason why he has the meltdown is because he's thinking, oh, shit, I'm next. Right. But in the movie, he doesn't vocalize any of that. So you just come away thinking he actually misses his friend because in the books, the actions towards Sejanus are all very friendly, like they are buddies. And in the movie, of course, it's all the same actions. So like they're buddies, you know, they're friends. You don't have any of Corio's thoughts to know that Corio doesn't actually care about Sejanus in that way, that he actually doesn't care about really anyone in that way. Um, maybe Tigris a little bit, but not really. And so because they don't 
have Koryo vocalize any of these thoughts that he's having, you see him having this meltdown about Sejanus, and you're like, oh my gosh, he's crushed. He just lost his friend, and oh no, it's his fault, and he has so much guilt. But that's just not true. That's not no. what's happening. Um, you also see, like, uh, at the at the side of the lake, that was the other big moment. At the side of the mm-hmm. lake, they have this talk where Lucy is like, well, wouldn't this be wonderful to be out here, and blah, 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 blah. blah. And they talk about trust. Yeah. And they talk about that they can trust each other. And because this is from Corio's point of view, it's almost it, you don't believe Lucy when you she says you can trust me. In the books, you know that she is being genuine and that it is his thoughts that then spiral into paranoia with whether or not she he can trust her. But in that moment, because you don't have those thoughts, you don't believe that he can trust her. Yeah, you just see the look on Corio's face and you're like, oh, shoot, he doesn't trust her. And so you as the audience member think she's not trustworthy, but that's not true. He doesn't trust her because of the thoughts that he has, not because of anything she's actually done. And in the book, you understand this so much better because the first or sorry, the third act isn't gutted the way that it is in the movie. So you have a lot more context about her prior relationship um, Mm -hmm. with uh, the other Covey boy whose name escapes me at the moment. Billy, Billy. Yeah, Billy, Billy Tope, Billy Tope. And you see like, oh, she fell for Billy Tope. He's a bad kid, yada, yada. She's falling for Corio. He's bad dude, yada, yada. You know, Um, so you kind of see that this is her. This is a character flaw for her that she's constantly falling for these guys that are just no good. And um, it's nothing to do with her moral compass. She just believes the best in people that she shouldn't. Yeah. And that she genuinely does believe him. But then from there on out, because all of their because of this distrust you are now reading uh corio's distrust in every single action that they do yeah uh so when she talks about running away together it's not like hey i want to run away with you it's oh i'm gonna run away you better run away too like Mm -hmm. it's a lot stilted it and in some ways, it's good because it loses the romantic notion that I think a lot of people that did not look at Corey, Corey <laughs> as a unreliable character ignore. Uh-huh. It's, see, uh, see our book episode for, for more of what Landon's talking about there. <laughs> but it hyper, it hyper swung the other way to then yeah. be like, oh, Corey was a good dude because Lucy also sucks. No, no, but that's not the case. And it's like, no, it's like, I get and- that he looks like Draco Malfoy, but he, we do not need to redeem this character he is unredeemable Mm -hmm. and like Uh, the final nail in the coffin for this is they they adjust the scene ever so slightly for when lucy figures out that he's not trustworthy and she needs to escape um where she actually says the line um no no loose ends except me so it looks like she puts the idea in his head of oh he should kill her now but that's not what happens when he's like realizing that he's found the guns and he's looking at the guns he's having those thoughts but because we're not privy to his thoughts if you haven't read the book you might not necessarily realize that the weird look on his face is because he's imagining like what if i killed lucy gray and got my life back because i could do that now um And her vocalizing that is trying to like say that she realizes he's thinking that, but that's not how it comes off. The way it comes off is she's putting the idea in his head. Yeah, because like if he said it, then he would just look like a bad guy. Like there would be no morally gray. It would be evil. He had the idea. He verbalized it out loud. That means he is going to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, Which like realistically, he doesn't know he is going to do it or not. Until he doesn't get the chance to do it. Yeah. Yeah, he's not even um, for sure. In the book, he's not for sure until the until the opportunity is gone. Until the and he regrets not gone. doing it. And he he freaks the fuck out and has mm-hmm. that regret that he didn't do it. Mm-hmm. Which does happen um, in the movie. But with no internal yes. dial- monologue, if you've not read the book, you don't necessarily know that that's what's happening. Um, <clears throat> And on that same note of like... This this particular screenshot of when they're having a conversation of like, well, how many did you kill? Mm-hmm. Like that whole conversation is drenching with mistrust from her when really it is not supposed to be. It's supposed I mean, it's supposed to be like 
the crumb that gets her to run away later. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's the first crumb she picks up. It's the first time that she's like, oh my God, this person that I, that said I could trust them. Can I trust them? Um, But before that, prior to that, because of the perspective we're taking, she already sounds suspicious of him in this scene. Yep. She already sounds completely like, oh, well, I don't trust you. And we, we're we not in this together. And like, it, it really truly did. I feel like they wanted cognizantly, they wanted to make sure that we knew that this wasn't a love story. And yeah. because of that, they took out any of the ambiguity because I was like, by the time they were running away together, I was like, do they even like each other? <laughs> <laughs> Like at this point, she's still she's still romanticizing him. You can't fucking tell though. Mm -mm. (laughs) Mm -mm. Nope. And I think that the ultimate conclusion that I had coming away from this movie is a lot of what it suffers from in the misinterpretation part of it is very similar to what hurt the first Hunger Games movies. Because if you didn't read the book, you didn't know what was going on in Katniss's head. And Jennifer Lawrence just looked like she was blank face staring at the camera doing nothing. Right. And people come away with the wrong conclusions if they had not read the books. And I think the same thing happens here. And here's my takeaway. Suzanne Collins characters are excellent in books and they just simply do not translate to excellent movie characters. You kind of have to know a little bit of background to fully connect with the character in the movie. You're going to miss a couple things here and there if you don't. Are you ready for a hot take? Mm hmm. That's yeah. not a Suzanne Collins problem. That's a per- book interpretation problem, Colin. But um, yeah, it, it it's it it could never like that is the difference in medium. Yeah, and Suzanne if Collins you, is an excellent novelist, so of course yeah. she's utilizing the best things about the medium. But if you want depth of character, the realistic thing is is that you're not going to get it in a movie. Mm-hmm. If you want deep and complex characters, unless they are the protagonist and the and the movie is about that journey mm-hmm. and, and solely fo- like I'm thinking like butterfly effects. I'm thinking um, like yeah. like the movies that are about human consciousness. Yeah. But the thing is, is that in movies, you've got two it. flaws. One, the view is of the camera. And yeah. two, the runtime is short. So if you want to have a visual medium that does the character work that a book can do, it can't be a movie. It's got to be like a TV show or a miniseries or something. Cause there's just not enough time. Well, and even like, I think miniseries is the only way to do it in some mm-hmm. aspects because like even a TV show, uh, you have to make sure to have enough plot to remain interested in, in things that sometimes aren't interesting. Mm-hmm. Like on the, on the outside, Corio's thoughts of how he like third act is not interesting. Yeah. It's, all of his thoughts that make that book and that phase and that time necessary. Yep. And they cut it out. Because it's boring. And it's just him like getting to know thinking. his his uh his co-workers, I guess you could say, his fellow soldiers, getting to and like hanging out. Like he doesn't do anything. No, but you learn you learn about his prejudices and how truly much he hates this and his level mm-hmm. of comfortability and how selfish he truly is and self-serving he is. Like yep. you start seeing the cracks behind the facade because the facade has been wiped away from him. And you realize that these things that he thought was protection in an act are not protection in an act. They are truly who he is, Mm -hmm. which is the whole purpose of like why this story is like that. He left district, like the Capitol, he had to leave the Capitol because it had to wipe away who he thought he was and recognize that that's the same person who he is. Yep. So, I think we are ready to have a little bit of a conclusion here. So I'm going to, yeah, let's ask the question, did it resonate? Well, yes, but I prefer the book. How do you feel? I think The Hunger Games has done an outstanding job of making movie adaptations. And this does not does not it does not rewrite that rule it is an it is an entertaining afternoon it's a really good movie it sparked debate in my house it sparked conversation uh i think it absolutely resonated the book is better Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh but i also understand the book is not everyone's medium yeah like not everyone has an audible subscription uh and uh so like 
yeah, it works. Absolutely. I think it ties into the movies really well, but I think it's also the Hunger Games, the Ballad of Songbirds and Snake's Light. Like it is the yeah. LT of the actual everything else. It is. It's the Cliff's Notes version. And so people that were saying that this was like so super boring, like walkout worthy, they were exaggerating. So if you saw some of those, like I saw some of those, they were wrong. Um, And people that said that they liked it, like that's because it's still basically a good movie. So if you enjoy the Hunger Games world, um, and, and you enjoyed the book, I would recommend seeing the movie. But if you did read the book, just keep in mind, like the movie really is a supplement to the book. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you can only really contain inside the book. And that's that's true, just like it was for the Hunger Games, the original Hunger Games movies. The only extra you will get, the only like net positive you will get from the the movie that wasn't in the books is Viola Davis's acting yeah. job. I mean, if you but you could see it for that alone. <laughs> and honestly, the the gifts and also honestly, like the the scenes in which I was like, man, if this was 2012, that would be gift for a Draco Malfoy face so fast. And I need that gif uh, collection for RP if that was <laughs> at that point in time. But True. we've outgrown that, unfortunately. Uh, but the girlies who are still on Tumblr doing the hard work for everybody, uh, catch this man being any blonde villain morally gray type guy in a uh rp thank you so much yes true and i <laughs> and i hope he gets a chance to play this this type of character again so i think that he i hope this is successful i also hope for rachel mm-hmm. she, she i great. know that there are so many people who are like i don't like her don't understand the drama behind it but she did fantastic and i yeah. hope she continues because i think she's a really good good actress yeah i think they're drinking the haterade like i think she did great she was one of the standout uh, performances to me also always love to see a hunter schaefer uh True. she's fantastic and beautiful and i did love her even if the writers did her dirty yeah and the costumers <laughs> so yeah we really liked it um all right that is our last slide for today so i'm gonna switch back to the webcams um but oh wrong one hang on this one. Okay. So, um, yeah, if you enjoyed the book, I think you would have a great time seeing the movie. Do I think you need to see it in theaters? No, you can totally just wait for streaming. Um, and if you have not read the book, but you know that it's the type of thing you would like, I think seeing the movie instead is acceptable. It has almost everything that the book had in it, and it hits a lot of the same notes. So I think you would have a lot of fun watching the movie if you don't have time to read the whole book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Overall, yeah. net positive. We love yes, it. Yes, very much a net positive. All right, Landon. Um, I know, I know, we already promoted your book, but uh, but let's wrap up with promoing it one more time. Um, for you can buy my book. Yeah, <laughs> uh, um, on book. Amazon. Uh, the lessons I paid for. It's a really, it's a beautiful poetry book uh, about all the lessons of my early twenties. Because your girl turned thirty this week, so that's the other thing. Buy it for my birthday. Happy uh, birthday, stream ooh. official. I know I told you on the day, but stream official. Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, you. Uh, it's all the lessons I learned in my twenties about myself and my relationships and my body and mm-hmm. who I am going to be in this world. And it's a really, really fun journey that. I hope everyone can connect to a part of it and maybe find comfort in some of my words, the way that I found comfort in words that were given to me at that point. Yeah, I think most Um, of my viewers are either in their 20s or have recently left their 20s, so it should be very relatable. Oh, good. Uh, And then also on that same note, follow me on TikTok. It do Mm -hmm. be bouncing over there right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, Again, got some really pretty aesthetic videos so come watch i'm land in maine at uh instagram and on tiktok yes all right um so for me we are actually going to take a break and do more wow season of discovery so but i need to eat some food so it's going to be a little bit of an extended break also Next week on Interstage Window is our Stardew Valley finale. So y'all come back for that for sure next Saturday. Um, But that's it. That's all the things for me at the moment. Um, Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, And of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day. Oh, can you say it one more time, Landon? It didn't catch. Don't forget to be awesome. There we go. Yeah, don't forget to be awesome. All right. Bye, y'all. Bye.